Welcome to the study of God's Word with Pastor Steve Wiseman, recorded live from Pee Wee Valley Baptist Church in Pee Wee Valley, Kentucky. To learn more about the many resources available through this ministry, visit us online at peeweevalleybaptistchurch.com. And now, here's Pastor Steve as we continue our study in the book of Galatians. In verse 6 of Galatians 2, of these, the these, by the way, refers to Peter, James, and John. Those are the ones that he had covered throughout the, the, the text, beginning in the first chapter. Uh, but of these who seem to be somewhat, uh, somewhat means anything. Uh, if you look at, just peek at chapter 6, and I think it's verse 2. Uh, no, verse uh, 3. Uh, Galatians 6, 3. For if a man think himself to be something... When he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. When a man think himself to be something. The word something there is the same Greek word as is used in our text and translated in verse 6 of chapter 2 uh, as somewhat. So something. So in verse 6 of chapter 2, but of these, Peter, James, and John, um, but of these who seemed, seemed is a word that, uh, that means think. And it's literally that which is of a, of a person's opinion. Now, you know, the word hypocrisy is, uh, is by definition, an opinion. Uh, an opinion that's not correct or that's different from, from what's been stated before. So you can't be hypocritical. That is talking one thing and doing something else. It's hypocritical. So, um, but the, of these, Peter, James, John, who seemed to be somewhat, well, they were somewhat, because they were, the, they were esteemed, honored, and valued as the, as the leaders of Christianity in Jerusalem and of the, of the preaching of the gospel to the Jews. They were the leaders who were preaching the true gospel. But of these who seemed to be somewhat, and they seemed to be somewhat by the, by the people uh, who were following them, uh, and they literally were, the, but you know, just a little byproduct in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, Paul talks about how the people in the Corinthian church, how they were, uh, they were picking who their favorite preacher was. Some like Paul, some like Apollos, you know. And you can't sort of pick and choose who you want. It was a criticism of the Corinthians because they had all kind of problems. It was right after Paul told them they were, they were carnal believers. <laughs> Uh, and they were trying to pick their favorite preachers. I saw just a, somebody post something on media, the social media the other day, and it said, who's your two favorite preachers of all time? And I thought about 1 Corinthians 3, and I thought, that goes against what Paul's preaching. It's not who we consider to be popular or who, do we, who we honor above and uh, others. God uses every God-called person who's preaching the gospel for his purpose to accomplish it through, through, through his way. So... But these people were esteemed and honored by those who were following them because they were preachers of the true gospel. And he says, whatever they were, um, and, uh, uh, and whatever they were uh, literally means they, Peter, James, and John, they walked with Jesus. And they followed Jesus. They were disciples of Jesus. And they were taught directly by Jesus, called directly by Jesus. Uh, Paul was not living during that time of Jesus. He came on the scene afterwards because people were preaching Christ as the Messiah and he was trying to persecute them. And that's when God knocked him down off his horse and saved him. And then he turned uh, to the gospel as God had called him and preached the gospel to the Gentiles. But they were, they were literally walking step by step with Jesus. Paul wasn't. So he says, whatever they were. So that's what they were doing. But because they were personal disciples who walked with Jesus on the earth, doesn't mean that Paul's any less. And that's what the false teachers, the Judaizers are trying to do, trying to tear Paul down, saying he wasn't like them. He wasn't like them because he can't be an apostle because he wasn't doing that stuff. Uh, if you listen to people today, you can be an apostle just by believing in Christ, but it's not true. So he says, whatever they were, so their personal experience with Christ, in essence, maketh no matter to me. It doesn't make any difference to me that they were personal witnesses and walked with him on the earth. 
He says, God accepteth no man's person. God is not biased, and he does not look at people in a way that's partial. He's not partial towards anybody. God called Paul differently than he called the other apostles, and uh, Paul understood that, and he didn't feel inferior to the other apostles because his experience wasn't the same. Neither did Paul consider his experience to be better than theirs, In the book of Philippians, it tells us that Paul said, I consider all my experience being a Hebrew of the Hebrews, studied under feet of Gamaliel. It was was the Pharisee of the Pharisees. He's top of the ladder, climbed the ladder of Phariseeism. He said, but I consider all that as dung. It's nothing. Just a big waste pile. Uh, So he didn't consider what he had done to be any better than anybody else. So Paul wasn't looking at what people had accomplished the difference in how God used them. Paul just knew that God called him to preach the gospel to the Gentiles, and he was doing that. And so what they were doing was okay. And then it goes on to say, uh, and they who seemed to be somewhat in conference, and because he was at the Jerusalem conference where they had the big meeting, and of course in a conference, guess who the leader is? It was James. James was the leader of the conference. Paul was an attendee. Uh, and, of course, James and John were sort of co-leaders with James. Um, Peter and John were because they were considered the leaders of the Jerusalem church. So Paul wasn't considered to be a leader, so he's sort of an outsider. So they were sort of looking at him with an eye, should we accept this guy or not, right? Because he didn't walk the earth with Jesus like we did. But he says at the end of verse 6, he said, to be somewhat in conference, they added nothing to me. That means they could not criticize, they could not pick apart anything, they didn't find anything that was wrong, they didn't find any fault, they didn't add anything, they didn't subtract anything, they added nothing. They didn't add any criticism or anything else. They didn't add anything. Uh, So it was the same gospel, exactly the same. Um, There was nothing to add, nothing to change, nothing to subtract. So in verse 7... We see how that God used uh, Peter, James, and John, and Paul to preach the same gospel to different audiences. In verse 7, so the same gospel, that's been established, verse 7, but on the contrary, or contrary-wise, on the contrary, when they saw, that is Peter, James, and John, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision, that was Paul's gospel to the Gentiles, was committed unto me as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, When they saw that, literally when they experienced that, and then parenthetically in verse 8, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, and that's to the Jewish believers in Jerusalem and the surrounding area, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Same gospel, same power of God operating through the preaching of the gospel. There was no difference. And... Keep in mind that the experience of Peter, James, and John and that of Paul were not known to each other. There was no cross-pollination. They were miles apart preaching the same gospel. They didn't know it until they got to the Jerusalem Council. They had heard some things, but they didn't know it. They didn't know it. So in the council, they understood uh, what, that the gospel was the same gospel that they were preaching, that Paul was preaching. So in verse 9, what did they do? It says, And when James, Cephas, who is Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, and that is they were pillars of the church, and perceived to be by the people, uh, so when, when they, Peter, Cephas, and John, when they perceived the grace that was given unto me, Paul speaking here, They gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go into the the Gentiles, is what we're talking about here, and they unto the circumcision. So the right hands of fellowship. Now, the, the right hand of fellowship in those days was a solemn vow of friendship and partnership. And so this was an af- it was a direct affirmation to Paul that they recognized he was preaching the same gospel. He was just preaching it to a different audience. And because the issue that had come up that brought them all to the council was the Judaizers trying to impose law 
and to put people back under the law and not under grace. And Paul was preaching, preaching salvation by grace, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, right? Paul was preaching salvation by grace, and Peter, James, and John were preaching salvation by grace, and by grace alone, through faith alone in Christ Jesus. So they were preaching the same thing, and, neither, and none of them, of the four of them, were teaching anything required other than faith. And so when they came together, they found out, uh, among many other things, that they were actually um, in, in exact agreement regarding the gospel and what salvation meant and how, how you obtain salvation. Um, and it's critical. This is the very beginnings of the church, the very beginnings. Um, and uh, I know a lot of people, they go, you know, if you... If you study the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the church has not begun yet. And if you study those four Gospels without understanding that or without keeping that in mind while you're studying them, you'll get all mixed up. You'll get all mixed up um, uh, on things because there were, Jesus and his apostles, the disciples, they were obligated to be under the law. Because the age of grace didn't come until after Jesus was resurrected from the grave and ascended into heaven. If the payment for the price of sin wasn't made until Calvary. And so the church had not been established. They were still operating under the law in the four Gospels. And a lot of people look at those four Gospels and they take information in that and they say that's the way we should be living today. And, you know, Jesus had in, uh, in the Beatitudes... Uh, in chapters 6, particularly in chapter, into chapter 5, chapter 6, uh, he talked about, you have heard that it's been said, but I say unto you. And what, you know, so the traditions that the, that the Jewish, that the, that the Jew, the Pharisees and scribes had established were wrong. Because, and they had established the traditions to be of greater import than the actual law itself, the Mosaic law. And they had all kind of little add-ons to the, to the requirements. Well, that's what people are doing today. They're adding little add-ons, you know. And I know people that, and a lot of people, even when they witness and they testify about Christ, they'll say, well, you know, if you follow Christ, uh, your life will be better. And, and, and the thing is that your life's not going to be better. You're going to have eternal life. And your experience probably is going to be worse because... We know that now, once, if you truly become a Christian by salvation through faith, what you find is the world opposes you and hates you because you're really a light bearer, a truth bearer, and you give truth to the world who wants to live in sin, uh, they're not going to put up with that. And so we Christians don't experience different things than unbelievers do by way of our experience in life because uh, there are still financial problems. There are still health problems. Christians get sick just like unbelievers do. And believers have financial problems just like unbelievers. We have problems with work, problems with the family, problems across the board, just like unbelievers. The difference is in how we handle them and what, how we're equipped to handle them. Because for the believer, Jesus says, cast your, cast your cares on me for I care for you. And if we take our prayers to the Lord and not be anxious or worried about them, uh, then we don't have to. The world has to be worried about everything because they have nobody to put their cares on. They want to share it with a friend, share it with somebody else, share it with that. And they need to share experiences. They need to build on each other. It's a big, huge network, and it's all futile. The only true uh, help comes from the Lord. He's the present help in time of need. The Scripture tells us that. So... Uh, they gave him the right hand of fellowship. And so the beginning, beginning of the church, it was critical because it bridges that because he, John wrote the Gospel of John. John also wrote the letters, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. And Peter wrote over the New Testament, 1st and 2nd Peter. And so, and James wrote the book of James. And so Paul also authored books in the New Testament. And we find that, that John, of course, the Gospel of John was written while the law is, was still in effect and everybody was still under the law, as a Jew, heathens weren't because, you know, they 
sort of did their own thing anyway. So, and the gospel had not been extended to the Gentiles until Paul came along. And we don't understand, like in the Old Testament, Rahab the harlot, that, you know, uh, faith has always been the requirement for salvation. We learned about the faith of Abraham. Faith has always been the requirement to be a child of God, a true child of God. And Rahab became a true child of God. She's mentioned over in Hebrews as, as one of those um, in, the, in the hall of saints, if you will, uh, the experiences of those who put their faith in God and how that they wrought great things. And all those examples are given out of the Old Testament, and Rahab's one of those. And it's because she had faith in God. Yeah, she lied, and she hid the spies. Uh, I mean, she hid, yeah, she hid the, uh, you know, the, the, the people that are spying out the country. And they came in, and she lied to them about where they were, and that was wrong. But God used a woman who had faith in God because she believed those guys were right. She did the wrong thing, but it was her faith that was counted for righteousness. The same thing with Abraham. The book of Romans tells us it was Abraham's faith that was counted to him for righteousness. And it's the same thing with us today. We put faith in Christ. God puts righteousness on our account. There's no difference. It's always been that way, Old and New Testament. We get to the church age, and we find that Peter, James, and, and John, who walked with Jesus... During the time when the law was still in effect, Judaizers are saying, you're still under the law. Paul comes along. He was one who taught the law. <laughs> and so they all come together with the gospel, which excludes the law. The law was a schoolmaster for us, and that's what the law was for, and it was effective. Um, you don't throw it all out, but you're not required, uh, you know, things like they don't sacrifice animals anymore. It still kills me today that the Jews believe in keeping the law. Uh, but they don't sacrifice animals anymore. I don't know how they get around that. Uh, they probably have a, their own excuses about why they don't do it. Um, but the, without, the Hebrews tells us without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. So if they're not sacrificing animals, where do they get their forgiveness from? I don't understand that. Uh, now, I'm not, a, I'm, not a, I'm not a master on Jewish theology, but I will say simply, they still have their faith they have their faith in the law, not in Christ. Not in Christ. Who, when Christ was, was, um, was crucified, and when he gave up his life, that the, the veil was written in two from the Holy of Holies. Now, according to the book of Hebrews, we go directly to the Father in prayer. Under the law, you had to go to the high priest. You had everything had to go to the high priest. The high priest took it to God. Uh, and, but... If you're doing it right, as a believer, you go directly to God. And it's only by His grace that we're able to do that. But what does God say in Hebrews? Come boldly before the throne of grace. Come boldly. So we can go to God directly. And we've got Jesus there as our advocate. And He's our defender, if you will. Now, a little off on, on just a, not a tangent, but on some explanatory information about the law versus grace because that was really the battleground where the church was established and the gospel that was being preached to the Gentiles and that which was being preached to the Jews uh, was discovered and declared to us to be the exact same gospel. And that's important for us to understand and know how God worked uh, through all four of those in very different ways and how the disciples had learned that from Christ in the earth, his earthly ministry. Paul learned it in the desert taught by the Lord. And they all came out with the same thing. So you're not going to go out in the wilderness today for three years. And, and with your Bible. And, and receive what Paul did. You're not going to do that. Uh, that was a, a, a once in an in a, in a, in a eternity calling, if you will. That which uh, Paul had. So it says, they gave uh, unto Paul the right hand of fellowship, which is this uh, vow of friendship and partnership, if you will. And it's a distinct sign of partnership in that culture in that day. Um, and, um, and that was aligning them totally and fully accepting Paul as a preacher of the true gospel to the Gentiles. And they had been teaching the true gospel to the Jews there in Jerusalem. So we find uh, Paul at the end of defending himself, if you will, 
we get into a little issue with Peter as we go on uh, verse 11 and forward. Uh, and we're not going to cover that in this session. It sort of changes the topic. And we don't want to get into that in the same session. But what we find in uh, verse 10 uh, <clears throat> is, um, is an affirmation of the love of the Gentiles toward the Jews. You know, and why is that important? Gentiles were hated by Jews, hated by Jews. The Jewish people hated the heathens, the Gentiles. They hated them. They considered them to be like dogs. They're just animals. They hated them. They were taught to hate them. Parents taught them to hate them. Uh, and because Israel was God's chosen people, not the heathen of the world. And they didn't want somebody else pretending that they could be a part of the family. And I think that's still the problem with Jews who insist on being under the law is they don't consider Christ to be the Messiah, the one who's come uh, to set people free because that's what he came for, to set people free. Free from what? The bondage to sin. And when you're under the law, you're under bondage to sin, and that's the difference. And when you come to the New Testament, Christ is the one who set us free from the bondage of sin. His shed blood did that. Because we were, in, we were slaves to sin before Christ shed his blood on the cross. That's why they had to keep going on the day of atonement. They had to go to the high priest. The high priest shed the animal blood and that atoned for the sacrifices. Atone, it was a, the sacrifices were atonement for the sins of the people. Uh, now we go directly to the throne of grace. Directly. Now, so it's important here in verse 10. It says, only they would that we should remember the poor, the saints... Um, the same, which I also was forward, the word forward means zealous, uh, ready and willing, or diligent, if you will. Only they would, they, Peter, James, and John, would that we should remember the poor. Well, who were the poor? The poor were the people in Jerusalem. Uh, from the time the 5,000 were saved at the very beginning, Peter preached a sermon and they kept preaching and, they kept, and people kept being saved and literally thousands upon thousands, ten thousands upon ten thousands of people were being saved. And Jerusalem, uh, people were coming to Jerusalem. That's where the church had started. They were coming to Jerusalem, if you will. And so people were coming there, and they, weren't with, they didn't have the wherewithal to stay there. They didn't have the jobs, and the economy wouldn't support it. Uh, and Jerusalem developed uh, one of the worst economic conditions of, of all time. And it was just horrible there. And they needed help. They needed help bad because the church was growing like wildfire, and they didn't have the wherewithal to support all the people who were now coming and living in Jerusalem. Um, so they needed help from outside. So what they said to Paul, in a, and this was just an addendum. An addendum, it's not something that was a requirement, but they said that they would. Uh, their desire is, if you would, that Paul would remember the poor. Uh, we there, means Paul and his co-laborers, would remember the poor, the same which I also was literally forward to do or diligent to do. And um, if you take a look at Acts chapter 11, and verse 29, we'll see in action what was going on. Um, Paul was already involved in this before he preached to the Galatians and before he wrote the book to the Galatians. Um, but in Acts chapter 11, uh, look at uh, last two verses, verse 29 and 30. It says, Then the disciples, every man uh, according to his ability... And here, of course, where um, this was the church at Antioch, uh, where they were first called Christians, if you will. And, but in verse 29, then the disciples, every man according to his ability, these are the people that were being saved. The disciples, every man according to his ability. This is the New Testament uh, method of giving. No longer is a tithe required. That was under the law. Under the law, you had to give 10%. Um, there's one person that I've talked to that said, you know, if, if the requirement was 10%, then the church wouldn't get nearly as much money out of me. And what does it say? Every man according to his ability. Um, and the ability, the ability to give is the determining factor. I'll give you a good example. Letourneau 
who developed, uh, you know, big earth-moving equipment, had a company for years, made a fortune. He didn't give 10% to the church. He gave 90% to the church, 90%, according to your ability. Well, he was just rolling in the dough, earth-moving equipment, in its groundbreaking stages, there weren't a lot of suppliers and manufacturers of the equipment. So these big earth movers that, you know, they would, you know, not only the trucks, but the, the equipment that would, uh, the scrapers, as they call them. And I've, my dad was a heavy duty mechanic and operator, so I got to go out and do some of this stuff when I was like a preteen. These big, huge earth scrapers, they go up and they, they drop a blade down and they just scoop this stuff up. It just picks up all this dirt, just tons of dirt. The tires, you can't even hardly reach to the top of it. Huge equipment. But Letourneau was one of the first developers and manufacturers of this, made a fortune. He gave 90%. That's the ability that he had. That's, that's, but, you know, you get, you get somebody who, you know, just barely is earning a livable salary. 10% uh, is not the requirement for them. Their ability is the requirement. Whatever they're able to give. Now, so a lot of people will say, well, you know, I got all these bills to pay. I got, you know, 15 different credit cards and I owe $85,000 and I just don't have the money to give to the church. Well, that's not a, your ability. That's sort of the stupidity of getting yourself into that situation, right? I mean, it's, it's error. So, because we extend ourselves. So why did we get all that indebtedness? Because we wanted all these things. And, um, you know, you can see it runs against the grain of the gospel, right? So, at any rate, according to ability. And the disciples, every one of them, according to their ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren who dwell in Judea. Those are the people in Jerusalem, if you will, as we call it. And in verse 30, which also they did. They did do that, and they sent it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul, who was Paul, used to be Saul, right? So it was sent by Paul. Paul was the one who was carrying the money. Now, if you go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and we'll compare these two uh, portions of Scripture. Look at the first three verses of 1 Corinthians 16. And Paul says, now, concerning the collection for the saints, that was Paul's uh, mantra. He, he wanted to provide relief, relief for the human needs that existed there in Judea and Jerusalem. He said, concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given order to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye. So he gave that to Galatia, he gave it to Corinth, wherever he went. Now keep in mind, Paul was not somebody who earned a salary for what he did. He was a tent maker. Um, in fact, uh, you know, and within uh, the, the, the two letters of the Corinthians, Paul says that I don't preach the gospel uh, out of willingness. He said, I preach it against my will uh, because the grace of God's called me to do that. He said, if I do it because I want to do it, I'm paraphrasing, if I do it because I want to do it, then I'm not a true teacher of the gospel. Let it sink in a little bit. There are people out there, sometimes I think about second, third generation preachers who sort of follow in the steps of, you know, dad, mom and dad these days, the way people are going, but they're not true preachers if they're, um, at least not in the churches. Um, so he says, collection for the saints, as I have given order to the church, even so do ye, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him uh, in store as God hath prospered. First day of the week is the Lord's day, it's Sunday. Um, and so um, that's why the collections are taken up and why the church is meeting on Sunday. It was uh, the day when Christ arose from the grave. Uh, so the first day of the week, let every one of you uh, lay by him in store as God hath prospered him. That's the ability, as God has prospered him. Let every one go as God has blessed or prospered, if you will. Um, it says, uh, that there be no gatherings when I come. So in other words, when I come, because Paul was yet to come, he wrote this letter to the Corinthians, he was hoping to get there for another visit, so that when he came, because see, Paul and his co-laborers were going to take the money to Jerusalem. So I don't want, I don't want you to wait till I get there, because if, if you wait until I get there, you'll just take up a quick collection and that's going to be it. But I want you to start laying in store the money uh, that is needed to support the uh, the. the the, the troubled ones in Jerusalem, if you will, 
who are really under duress. And so in verse 3 says, And when I come, whomsoever you shall approve by your letters, then will I send to bring your liberality unto Jerusalem. You see, by their ability, and um, as God has prospered them, what that turns out to be is liberality in verse 3. We're not going to have a lesson here on giving. Uh, that's later in, in 2 Corinthians uh, chapters 8 and 9. And uh, we've been through that and been through it recently. But uh, God wants hilarious givers. Literally the word that's used in the Greek means hilarious. Uh, we're to give, and uh, people uh, to try to tone it down have said God wants joyful givers. Well, we should give it with joy, but the thought behind it is that the joy that we express in giving actually is hilarity because it's like, I can't believe I was able to do that. Uh, it's that kind of support that was needed for the churches in Jerusalem. It's that kind of support that's needed for gospel preaching churches. Um, now there, um, so because people don't give according to their ability, and a lot of churches preach, you just give 10%, uh, which for a person who's making, you know, uh, $500 million a year, 10% uh, may not even be close to their ability. But for somebody who's earning 12000 a year, it may be uh, well beyond their means to give 10%. But that's not, the, that's not the reason it was changed, because God changed it. It's not a requirement to give a 10%. What's required is you give, and you give liberally, and you give joyfully. You give hilariously. And be a cheerful giver, as it's been expressed many times. Um, so give according to ability and give in accordance with what God has proper to, prospered you and then it'll be liberal. But Paul was interested. So what we find there in Galatians, as we go back to that and close it uh, for this evening, uh, Galatians chapter 2 and verse 10, he says, Only, in other words, there was nothing to add uh, at the end of verse 6. They added nothing to me. And the only really refers back to that. Here's the only thing we're going to ask of Paul. You don't need to change anything because you're preaching the same gospel we're preaching. You guys got a different audience. The only thing we're asking of you is that uh, you would remember the poor, the saints which I also was diligent to do. And that's what Paul, he was zealous to do it. Um, the word uh, there means ready and willing. Ready and willing. Paul was ready and willing to do it. Um, and, uh, you know, he wasn't one who was taken. Of course, there were people that accused Paul of taken. We studied that over in, uh, in Corinthians as well. There were those who, of course, they were not fans of Paul, and so they accused him of taking money out of the gift that was given to the, uh, to the saints at Jerusalem. You know, if you're taking, you know, like today, uh, I've had several times since I've been here going out of the church and say, oh, I forgot to put my money in the offering plate. Here, can you take this? I said, no, I can't take this. I don't handle money in the church at all. And it's just a principle. You can't give it to me, and then we had one just recently, and I told them give it to, you know, give it to George and Gary. Uh, you know, they're deacons at the church. I mean, uh, not George, but James and Gary. They're deacons of the church, and because the people who, the ushers who collect weren't here, so they took the money and they put it in there and they counted it. I don't know how much money's given, um, you know, and I have told the treasurer of the church. Y'all have never met the treasurer. She has cancer. She's still the treasurer. She just lives, you know, a few blocks down the road here. And her name is Paulette Hensley, and, uh, but she's our treasurer. And we had the conversation early on, and I said, Paulette, I don't want to know how much people give. I don't, I don't want to know. It's not, it's not important to me uh, because we, we all answer to God alone. And, 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 you know, I don't preach on giving, and it's a little aside from the context here, but I don't preach on giving um, except when it comes up in the Scripture. So it came up in the scripture. We're going to talk a little bit about it. But um, literally, Paul was exhorted to get the money and bring it. Paul wasn't one to want to take up collections for himself. So I understand that. Uh, but Paul was transporting the money, but he had co-laborers with him. I don't think Paul actually handled the money. Other people handled the money, and he was responsible to do it. But he got charged, and that's what happened. So I don't want to be somebody handing me money and going putting it in a stack of money you know, the deacons may say, or the, collect, uh, the ushers may say, well, I wonder how much was really given. You know, I don't want a question going in somebody's mind. Though don't ever try to give me any money. 
inside or outside the church. I don't want it. Not here for the money. Don't draw a salary. Never have drawn a salary. Um, and I just, I preach the gospel like Paul said. He said, if I do this thing willingly, then I have my own reward. But if I do it against my will, then I have the charge of God in my life. And that's what Paul preached. And that's, that's the same mantra I use in preaching the word of God. It worked well for him. And, you know, um, one of the things that, that Paul taught much about, much about in the scriptures is, um, and he wasn't the only one, but about preaching for filthy lucre's sake. And there are preachers who are very wealthy off their preaching. Very wealthy off their preaching. I can honestly say that I haven't received any money. So what I have did not come out of anybody's pocket that had ever entered the door of a church. Uh, it came from my employment as I worked my way through life. I've, um, I've worked for two Fortune 500 companies. The Lord blessed me in doing that. And, um, you know, for years, I worked 28 years for Ford, and I said, um, Ford doesn't, uh, I said, the, the, you know, that, that Ford provides the means, but there's not Ford. The Lord provided the means through Ford. Um, and I don't want to get the two words mixed up. <laughs> the Lord provides the means. And as the Lord provides and he enables us and, he, and as he prospers us, as we read in the scripture in 1 Corinthians, that's the basis upon which we give. So Paul was charged, not charged, but he was asked by the other apostles if you will, to bring money to relief, to, re, to give relief to the people in Jerusalem because they were in dire need, and they were in dire need. It's amazing to see how the gospel came, how, how, how the Judaizers tried to set up friction between Paul and the other apostles and to undermine the, the underpinnings and beginnings of the church, and it failed. And attempts to overthrow God's word will always fail because God's word will always prevail. God's word will never pass away. It is eternal. And we know that because Christ is the word and he's eternal. And we know that he is uh, going to take us home to be with him as we sung. And when we've been there 10,000 years, uh, it's like we've just begun. I can't believe it. You know, I mean, I, I'm 70 plus, 74 years old. Turned 75 in a couple of months. And I'm just thankful to have the 74 years the Lord's given me. I don't know. I could die before the sun sets today. Any one of us could. But thankful for what time he's given me. But to think about, I think about the 74 years I've lived, and I think about how long that is, how many experiences, how much time. It's, you know, it's just incredible. Uh, and to, to think about what we're just singing about. It's phenomenal that uh, time, time, time never ends. And the thought then turns me to unbelievers and how time will never end for them either because uh, they're gonna, not going to perish. They're going to eternally suffer agonizing pain in a torturous lake of fire. Uh, that should give us a little impetus to get out there and get some folks... Uh, not for us to get them saved, but to give them the gospel message so they can get saved. It says in the scriptures, the one who winneth souls is wise. It means it's going to be studied up in the scriptures. And, you know, I know there's, and I've, I've seen these plans of evangelism, and everybody says the same thing. You want to go to heaven, you know, and I say, drop all of that. Let the Lord speak to you. They didn't have, they didn't have evangelization plans back in the New Testament. They just shared the word of God. I remember the, you know, Philip was preaching the gospel out of the Old Testament. And we can do that. If we learn the scriptures, we can lead a Jew to salvation. Um, and uh, we can't save them, but we can give them the information and let them make their own decision. But let's be, let's don't just be students of the word. Let's be servants of the Lord and serve him wisely so that we reach others with the gospel. We talk about how much error is going on in the world, but... We can't just talk about it and let it be. We actually have to get involved and, and, and involve ourselves as the Lord leads us and as the Lord gives us opportunity. And, you know, it, it may be a radio ministry. It may be a Facebook ministry. It may be a ministry at work. Um, I know we had at the Ford plant where I worked in Norfolk, we had 10 preachers working in the plant. Um, and, uh, you know, we shared experiences. We shared pulpits. If we had like faith, not every one of them did, but 
I did with the ones. Um, I'm on a softball team, and there's three preachers. Uh, I, was, I was sharing information, and somebody, so, uh, who, who all was on the team, and one guy piped up and text messaging at the very beginning of the season, said, hey, we got three preachers on our team. And wasn't 10, or, 10 minutes later, one guy says, I'm not playing this year. <laughs> He's not going to play with three preachers. <laughs> he, he, he got off the team and not even playing softball this year. Uh, but he had signed up for it. Uh, but you know, when you, when, you, when you share the word with other people, they're going to shy away from it. Uh, the reason I engage and involve myself in extracurricular activities is you, you meet people in everyday walks of life and you never know who you're going to impact. The Lord will, Lord will pave your path and set the opportunity up and but we have to do the work and so let's do that let's not be just students of the scripture but serve the lord with the passion that we might see other folks saved let's uh, let me remain seated for prayer father we're thankful for your word for its power um, father we're thankful that we're able uh, with the freedom that you've provided to us to come and to study this evening corporately uh, and we pray, Lord, that we have pleased you in what we have done and that we will equally please you with what we do, with what you've given us tonight in the days and weeks ahead. For it's in Christ's name that we ask it. Amen.